Hi, my name is Shauna Alexander. I'm Vice President of Coffee and Sustainability at Stumptown Coffee Roasters. So I head up all of the coffee sourcing, roasting, and the sustainability strategy for the company. Stumptown was founded in 1999 here in Portland, Oregon. So we've been around for 21 years. In the early 2000s, we were one of the pioneers of direct trade sourcing. So I'll share what direct trade means to us, our three core principles of direct trade impact indicators to evaluate how we're performing on those principles, and then the results of the research that we've done with two different partners in three different countries. So the three core principles of direct trade, as Stumptown defines it, are first and foremost to know the farmers, know the producers, know the people who are producing the coffee, know the farms. The second principle is to pay quality-driven, stable prices year after year. And the third principle is to commit to long-term relationships. In the early 2000s, as everyone who's watching this probably remembers or knows, it was the middle of a severe price crisis that had put a lot of farms that had been around for decades, if not centuries, out of business. And so direct trade was developed because it was clear that the commodity market was not incentivizing and rewarding great coffees. And we were interested in really good coffees. And so it was important to ignore the commodity price and instead set prices based on quality and be able to know that those prices were getting back to the producers. So negotiating directly with producers and knowing all the producers was really important. And then also saying, hey, we're not in this just for a short term win. We're in it for the long haul. We want to be sourcing from y'all for a long time. And that was how direct trade came to be. Codifying the principles of direct trade was the first step for us to begin to evaluate the impact of direct trade in at farm and community level at origin. Um, I started at Stumptown about three and a half years ago. And when I started, I was so um, excited to see when we evaluated all of the supply relationships we had all over the world, how long we'd been sourcing from producers and the consistency that we had, um, even over after so many changes in the market and for the company, there was a lot of consistency. And so um, we took that first step of identifying those three principles, and then we said, well, let's look at how this is working for producers and their communities. And we needed help identifying um, impact indicators for each of those three principles. It broke down kind of like this. First of all, if we, are, if we know producers and know their farms, and we're pay paying stable, quality-driven prices, and we're committing to long-term relationships, there were some indicators that could um, help us evaluate each of those. So first of all, we landed on the income per hectare at farm level. And that's really important because um, we know the FOB price we're paying. And FOB prices are something that um, some companies publish, which is great, but how much of that is actually getting back to farm gate? How much of that are the producers actually seeing? That's the harder question. And so we really wanted to look at that and say, how can we know, particularly in smallholder supply chains, that the prices that we're paying are getting back to the farmer? And so income per hectare was a good indicator of that. And the other thing that it accounts for is productivity, because we also knew that um, if we're sourcing for three or more consecutive years, which by the way is how we define direct trade, we don't call something direct trade unless we've been sourcing from producers for three or more consecutive years, we know that they're making investments in their families and in their farms, and a lot of times that includes investments in productivity. Um, I've heard it said that price is the best fertilizer, and that's true. Uh, producers invest in fertilizers, pruning, renovations, whatever it is, and their productivity goes up, so they've got more coffee to sell, they're getting better prices for it, and it creates a virtuous cycle. Um, which is one of the things that was identified in our initial research, which we did in partnership with Catholic Relief Services in Colombia. So, income per hectare is one of the indicators. The other thing we wanted to look at is, well, how much of our book of business is actually what we would consider direct trade at least three or more consecutive years. And so we broke down our supply base by the length of relationship 
And so the percentage of our supply by length of relationship at origin was another indicator we looked at. We also looked at volume growth over time because um, again, in our initial research with Catholic Relief Services in Tolima, Colombia with the El Jordan Group, they identified that actually one of the biggest drivers of benefit was the volume growth over time. So we looked at that and then we tried to see, well, how can we know what the impacts are in a community? One of the most reliable indicators of community well-being is the percentage of children in school. That was recommended to us by Inveritas in subsequent research we did with them in three supply chains in Colombia, Nicaragua, and Ethiopia. And I thought that was a really great recommendation because it reflects the interests that the farmers have. It's one thing to make up a community well-being indicator if you're sitting in Portland or London or Bonn or wherever, but it's a different thing to have something that reflects the agency that the producers have in their own lives and in their own communities. And one of the first things that we know that people do anywhere in the world, if they can afford school fees, is they put their kids in school. So I'd like to share the results of research that we've done with Catholic Relief Services and with Inveritas in Colombia, Nicaragua, and Ethiopia. Um, we started in 2018 with uh, impact assessment in the El Hordan, with the El Hordan group in Tolima, Colombia. And we did this with Caravella, our supply partner Caravella, and Catholic Relief Services Colombia. They used an approach that really helped inform um, the next wave of our research that we did within Veritas. And the approach that uh, CRS took was we did these open-ended interviews with all of the members of the El Hordan group and they used a methodology called most significant change where it's just really open-ended questions that ask something along the lines of what's the most significant change in your life or on your farm as a result of the commercial relationship with Caravella and Stumptown. And the results were really interesting. It was what we had heard a lot anecdotally, but this really backed it up with data that having that stable price year after year gave them the confidence to invest in their farms and they were earning about 32 percent over the regional average because they also um, crs also interviewed a control group in the uh, in the region so that they had something to compare it to um, the control group was selling into the traditional market and so they were earning um, about 32% more on average between 2012 and 2017, and that was, that was good, but the other big driver of impact was volume growth over time. So those two things in partnership created um, a virtuous cycle of investment in farms and investments in families that had benefited those producers and enabled them to increase the size of their farms and also add additional producers to that group. We gathered a lot of, a lot of quotes from these long form interviews that they that CRS then aggregated and analyzed. Um, and so we can share some of those quotes here. It was very cool to hear things from the producer's perspective. Of course, when someone has a stable income that grows over time, they have confidence to invest and there are positive impacts at farm level and at community level. And we certainly see that with regards to quality and stability of quality and stability of supply. So this really is an approach that works throughout the supply chain. It's not just serving us or just serving producers. It really is something that seems to work well for all. But it really informed the rest of our research that we did. We worked with Inveritas then in, in Nariño, Colombia, in Nueva Segovia, Nicaragua, and in the Jima Zone of Ethiopia to evaluate some direct trade um, supply chains that we had there. And they were the ones who helped us hone in on um, other indicators that included the income per hectare. And so that was really helpful to get the information on, in, on income per hectare that producers were getting. As um, everyone on this call probably knows, it's pretty difficult to get that information in smallholder supply chains. And so it was interesting for us to see that producers in, in our Stumptown direct trade supply chains were earning 
you know, in many cases, two times more than the regional average or even the fair trade average. And I think that correlates to the fact that the prices we're paying are well above, obviously, commercial price and also well above the fair trade minimum. So we were very happy to see that. We have a lot more research to do, but that initial data that we had from those three supply chains seemed really positive and spoke to the um, transparency and traceability and the strength of the partnerships that we had in those, in those regions. We also wanted to share about what it meant for, to be in, um, to be committing to long-term partnerships, long-term sourcing partnerships, because we can talk about that, but how does that really break down in terms of our overall supply? And so we ran the numbers and in 2020, 67% of all of the coffees that Stumptown purchased were from supply relationships of five or more consecutive years. So 87% are what we consider direct trade. A lot of people use the term direct trade in the first year of sourcing for a producer they've met or a farm they visited, but we reserve it for relationships of three or more consecutive years. And within that 87% and then that subset of 67%, over 30% of the coffee we bought in 2020 was from supply relationships of 10 or more consecutive years. So these are coffees that we've had on the menu for 10, 15, sometimes more years than that. Um, very familiar names for anyone who drank Stumptown or has been around Stumptown for a while. Ellen Herto in Guatemala, Mordecai in Ethiopia, El Hordan Group that I've mentioned, El Puente in Honduras. There's so many I could mention. It's a source of pride for us to have continued those relationships over you know, a lot of changes in the business and a lot of changes in the market. It's, that's not always the case, but we're really happy when that is the case. We also looked at volume growth over time. And so we were, when we looked at kind of the origins of some relationships and then where we are now, you know, we're seeing significant volume growth over the course of five, 10, 15 years. Could be four times the growth or 10 times the growth, but, um, of course, that's going to drive positive impact at farm and community level, and it drives positive impact for us too. Again, these are like when, we, when these coffees come back on the menu, come back into the roastery, it's like welcoming back an old friend. Um, so that is how we have approached direct trade for um, many years and why we have such a level of consistency and quality. One of the things we were curious about are what have been what have been the ripple effects in the community. And so the indicator of the percentage of children enrolled in school was a cool one to hone in on with Inveritas because it really reflected the interest of the farmers, the agency of the farmers, the um, what producers do when they become profitable and they're able to really invest in their families and in their farms. Of course, they pay school fees and put kids in school. We'd seen that over many years, I've seen it in my career. I know um, and Veritas had said that they'd seen it, of course, in many communities over the years. But as the community becomes more prosperous, you see a higher percentage of kids in school. And in the Stumptown supply chains, um, nearly 100% of children were in school. So we were happy to see that. So we'll be curious if um, those results and the other results uh, continue in the research that we'll be doing in coming years. So those are some of the initial results from research that we've conducted over the past few years on the impact of direct trade for producers and communities. Uh, to recap, the impacts of direct trade were really that it was effective in incentivizing, rewarding quality and growing volume of quality coffee over time and that the approach had positive ripple effects in the communities of smallholder, smallholder producers we source from um, through direct trade relationships. So we're happy, to, we're happy to see this and know that those three principles I outlined in terms of knowing the producers, offering stable, quality-driven prices, and committing to long-term relationships over time uh, together work in that way and also, it's important to note, it only works when you're working within a traceable and transparent supply chain, and that requires really good partners, partners all along the chain. So we're very grateful for the supply partnerships we have. Um, we know this is just a start, 
and also that the market and global conditions are super crazy right now. So um, never seen anything like this in Stumptown's history uh, with the supply and logistics challenges that are happening all over the world. We are committed to great coffee. That's what Direct Trade was designed to deliver. And we're committed to learning more about what we can do better and learning more from the producers we work with around the world. Mm -hmm.